We want to thank you musicians and singers, amen. Uh, how, many, how many know that uh, uh, this week, amen, uh, Pastor Lavalley has also probably gotten your address too, amen? amen. And uh, you're like, man, that was right for me. That was that was exactly what I needed, amen. And so uh, uh, let's uh, give him another warm welcome, amen, as he comes, and uh, maybe I, it'll be your address tonight. I amen. turn up. Hallelujah. <laughs> say once again what a blessing it is. You guys got a great church, great spirit. Amen. I really do like your song service. Got some trumpets in there. And it's just Amen. tremendous. Amen. It's lesson. Amen. And uh, I can't sing in tune and I can't keep a beat, so. <laughs> Amen. I, I envy folks that can. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And really been a tremendous time. Just a, such a, a wonderful spirit here to see him. People that we've worked together for years in the, in the boot camp, and just a, a real uh, closeness there, and really do appreciate it. Appreciate that uh, generous offering, and just a blessing to labor together in the Lord. Let's turn our Bibles to Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter four. Amen. I read an article, and the title uh, caught my attention: anxiety is a bigger concern for teens more than drugs and more than poverty. And so I'll just read a couple of excerpts from the articles. As teens were the most likely to say, stress and anxiety were a major concern for their peers. More than drug addiction, bullying, or even poverty, according to a study by the Pew Research Center, goes on to say that pressure to drink or do drugs was at the bottom of the list. Only around 15% of teens felt that pressure to do so. But more, uh, 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 talking about the teens that uh, are suffering or issues of anxiety, it goes on, more Americans than ever are stressed, mm. depressed, mm. and anxiety ridden, and many are unable to get the help they need. An estimated 8.3 million American adults, about 3.4% of the population, suffer from serious psychological distress. Mental illness is on the rise, suicide is on the rise, and access to care for the mentally ill is actually getting worse. Hundreds of thousands of Americans live with serious psychological distress which is an umbrella term that runs from general hopelessness and nervousness all the way up to the diagnosable conditions such as depression and anxiety. This is a very disturbing finding because of the implications of what mental illness can do to a person in terms of their ability to function and their overall lifespan. The Bible says in Luke chapter 21, verse 26, that in the last days, men's heart will fail them for fear man, man. and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Man. I remember in the early 1980s, Pastor Mitchell stood and he preached and he said the next issue that people are going to really have to deal with is mental soundness. Man, man. He did a, a, a Sunday school on the mind, and this was in the early 80s, and, and I remember him saying he predicted what the future is going to be hold, hold for people without Jesus and how valuable it's going to be mentally to be saved. And sure enough, it played out. And I want to look at our scripture this morning or this evening. And I want to, I'll get to it in a minute, but I want to talk about stress. Amen. 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 I don't want to stress you out, but I do want to talk about stress. <laughs> Amen. Because this is becoming more and more of a issue. And our, gen or this generation is uh, having a very difficult time how to deal with it. We have the University of Georgia in my town. And I go there, and we go there, and we preach quite a bit. And what has caught my attention, 
over the last several years is the rapid increase of emotional support animals, everywhere from dogs to who knows what. As I begin to look at that, this is huh, people that are trying to cope with the issues of life, uh, amen, as best as they can. But how many know this word is not silent concerning how to deal with these issues? Man, man, man. And our scripture in Philippians is exactly how to handle all of life's situations. Once again, it proves that the word of God is as up to date as a tomorrow's newspaper. We're going to get into detail of this. Now I want to deal with stress and anxiety, worry and the cares of of life. I mean, no, we don't really call it worry or anxiety. We can rename something. I'm just really concerned. Yeah. No, you're worried. You're anxious. Stress is your body's way. This is what the definition. Stress is your body's way of responding to any kind of demand or threat. When you sense danger, whether it's real or it's imagined, the body's defenses kick into high gear in a rapid automatic process known as the fight or flight reaction, or it's known as the stress response. You're walking down a trail, you see a rattlesnake, you ought to be stressed a little bit. <laughs> Part of that is good, it's our fight or flight reaction. The stress response is the body's way of protecting you and I. And when working properly, it helps us to stay focused, uh, energetic, and alert. In emergency situations, stress can save your life, uh, giving you an extra, giving you extra strength to defend yourself, uh, uh, or spurring you on uh, to uh, to react very quickly. Stress can also help you and I rise to meet the challenges. It'll keep you on your toes during a presentation that you're given or it sharpens your concentration when you're attempting to maybe shoot that game-winning free throw or drives you to study for an exam when you'd rather be sleeping. And so these things have their place in our lives. But beyond a certain point, Stress stops being helpful and starts causing major damage to your health, your mood, your productivity, relationships, and even your overall quality of life. I remember as a, as a teenager in high school, uh, we got a 1966 uh, uh, Ford Mustang, that 289 engine. It has a great passing gear. You're driving down the road and you want to pass old grandma because she's just putzing along. And you hit the, and you take off, you pass. And then, of course, you go back that slow and you do the speed limit again, right? <laughs> but that car is not meant to drive in that passing gear all the time. That'll max out the engine and burn it out. What happens to your body when the fight or flight response when you feel threatened, your nervous system responds by releasing a flood of stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol, which rouse the body to, for emergency action. I don't know if you saw the article where this one guy, a car fell on this man, and a, a man came in and lifted the car by himself. He came by, four or five people were trying to lift, they couldn't, this man, in, 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 in uh, his adrenaline kick, a lift car by himself, they pulled the man out. That's what it's set there for. But if you're functioning at that level all the time, your body's going to burn out. Amen. Amen. Your nervous system isn't very good at distinguishing between emotional and physical threats. If you're super stressed over an argument with a friend, a work deadline, a, a, a mountain of bills, huh, your body can react just as strongly uh, as if you were facing a true life or death situation. Uh, but the more your emergency stress system is activated, uh, the easier it becomes to trigger and it's harder to shut off. And what is happening is people are worrying about this, uh, stressed about that, concerned about this. They fear that. And pretty soon their body's in a, in a high stress mode all the time. Uh, and they're suffering uh, from the results of that. 
chronic stress disrupts nearly every system in your body. It can suppress your immune system, upset your digestive system and reproductive system, increase the risk of heart attack and stroke, and speed up the aging process. It can even rewire the brain, leaving you more vulnerable to anxiety, depression, and other mental health concerns. Goes on to this article, health problems caused or made worse by stress. Depression, anxiety, sleep problems, autoimmune diseases, digestive issues, skin conditions such as eczema, rashes, hives, heart disease, weight problems, reproductive issues, thinking or memory problems, goes on signs and symptoms of stress overload. The most dangerous thing about stress is how easily it can creep up on you like a pot of boiling water, a, slow, a pot of water rising with a slow boil boil, boil uh, and to you actually become used to it and it seems normal. Inability to concentrate, poor judgment, seeing only the negative, anxious or racing thoughts, panic attacks, constant worrying, depression, moodiness, feeling overwhelmed, loneliness and isolation, aches, pains, this one caught my attention, diarrhea or constipation. Man. Come on. <laughs> Nausea, dizziness, chest pain, rapid heart rate, uh, frequent colds or flu, rapid shallow, shallow right breathing, uh, and it goes on and on. Uh, the causes of stress, uh, the situations and pressures that cause are known as stressors. Uh, however, however, anything that puts high demands on you can be stressful. Then those are the external things. Of course, there's internal things. And finally, what causes stress depends, at least in part, on your perception of it. And so this is no complication for God. How I many God created us a certain way? Yeah. The Bible declares we are fearfully and wonderfully made. <coughs> and in our text of scripture, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter from a Roman prison. And we need to understand this is not your local county jail. This is not even your federal, U.S. federal penitentiary. This is an ancient Roman prison. You know, if you, went, if you had to go and live like one of the kings in the times of the Bible, you would say that it was a terrible lifestyle. No electricity, no refrigeration, no air conditioning. No uh, 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 refrigeration, as I said, uh, none of these things. Uh, and so uh, uh, no modern medicine. Uh, the Apostle Paul is in a Roman prison, basically a dark, filthy, uh, uh, rat infested, uh, unclean human waste, the stench, uh, 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 no light. Uh, he's, in a, he's in a dungeon. Yeah, man. And he's writing this letter from a very stressful place, amen. And in those days when you were put in prison, if you, if you didn't have friends on the outside that would come and feed you and clothe you on a regular basis, you were left to die and to rot. That's your problem, not theirs. And so we need to understand where Paul is writing from. He's in the middle of this thing where if you were to put you and I in there for even one day, we'd be completely stressed out. At least I would. Man. He's awaiting his fate. Is he going to be set free? Is he going to be executed? Is he going to be left there to rot? There's health issues. There's disease. There's infection. There's rats. There's all kinds of filth and human waste and excrement. There's no ventilation. It's dark. It's dense in there. People are there that are filthy. Uh, amen. And he's practicing what he's preaching. Uh, he's actually doing uh, what he's writing in this letter. Uh, he's telling them how to deal with the issues and anxieties of life. This is not a professor in some uh, college uh, classroom uh, spouting off some theory that he's never tried to live by. Come on. And Paul has no idea 
that the advice he's giving is going to help countless millions of people over the years. Now, I have a, a theory. <clears throat> Theories are meant to be tried and tested and proven. My theory, and I believe it's backed up by the word of God, is God takes what the devil meant for evil in your life and turns them to good if, I mean, that's the biggest word you'll ever say, mm -hmm. if we pray and obey. Amen, amen. If we will really lay hold of God. Amen. And I want to issue you a challenge this evening. Whatever you're tempted to worry about, whatever you're tempted to get overly anxious about, allow it to become fuel and motivation to pray. Amen. 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 Allow it to drive you to your knees and uh, usher you into the presence of God. Yeah. There's a story in the book of Samuel of Samuel's mother, Hannah. Hannah was barren. She could not have children. And uh, uh, in those days, you know, her husband had another wife as well. Uh, the other wife uh, was producing children uh, and she was a torment to Hannah. And she would torment Hannah. Oh, you can't have any kids. And well, what about my kids? And it would go on and on. And it tormented her. But she didn't just worry about it. She didn't just let it stress her out. She let that become the motivation that drove her to her knees and caused her to cry out to God. And she said, God, if you'll give me a son, I promise I'll dedicate him to you for the rest of his life. And that prayer was answered and Samuel was at birth and God gave, uh, she gave him uh, to the Lord. But then she went on and had some more children. Come on, come on. So it's not just getting anxious. Let's pray. Amen. See, God really wants you to pray about what you're anxious about. God wants you to find out his will for your situation and pray, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, I'm going to bring the will of God from heaven down to earth by my prayers. Yes. Yes. Amen. And in order to have his kingdom come, and his will be done on earth requires our prayer. How many know it's not automatic? Right. The will of God is not automatic. The will of God, what God wants on the earth, amen, is linked many, many times to whether or not we pray the will of God down from heaven. And how many know a lot of times our prayers are not as strong as they should be? If you're facing a situation that's really making you anxious and fearful and stressed, it's going to take more than a couple of robo shambos to bring it down. <laughs> my dad taught me how to pray over my food. Rub a dub dub. Thanks for the grub. Go God. Go Amen. <laughs> it's going to take more than that. Amen. I mean, the story of Daniel. Amen. Daniel's reading in the book of Jeremiah. He comes to the passage of Scripture. It says that uh, the children of Israel are going to be exiled to Babylon for 70 years. He breaks out his calendar. He said, It's up, it's over. We're, we've been here 70 years. So the will of God is for the children of Israel to go back to, to uh, uh, Jerusalem and begin to uh, rebuild things. The 70 year uh, uh, discipline is over. He looks around, it's not happening. So he sets his face before God to fast and to pray. And 21 days later, the angel Gabriel appears to him and says, from the moment you begin to pray, God answered your prayer and sent me. 
but it took me 21 days to break through the power of Persia, which is modern day Iraq and Iran, to break through that. And now I'm here to answer your prayer, Daniel. The point is this, as soon as he began to pray, God answered, but there was something in the spiritual realm. He didn't get the breakthrough for 21 more days. God wanted to do something. It was his will to have it happen. But it wasn't until Daniel pulled the trigger and stayed at it, not being anxious, but praying. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. God's command is be not anxious. Instead, pray. Worrying is only going to make matters worse, not better. And unfortunately, sometimes we are more of a prayer worrier than a prayer warrior. I was thinking about Jesus standing before Pontius Pilate. Jesus is standing there and he's not worried. And, and, and Pilate sees this. He says, don't you know I have the power yeah. to take your life or I have the power to spare it? Yeah. And Jesus says, you don't have any power except yeah. it's yeah. given you from above. Man. <laughs> Therefore, whoever turned me over you has the greater sin. And that stunned Pilate. I think instead of, it wasn't Jesus standing before Pilate, it was Pilate standing before Jesus. Man, man. Yeah. Jesus wasn't worried. Man. You know why? Because in the garden, he worked it out in prayer. Man. He prayed so hard he sweat blood. Mm. He had worked it out in prayer. And because he worked it out in prayer, when all these things begin to come down, he was not worried. He was not stressed. It was obviously very, very difficult. But his mind was made up. In our text of scripture, Paul says, be careful for nothing. That word careful means filled with care or anxiety. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, remember, he's in prison. One of the main problems in prison yeah. is right here. Yeah. He says, finally, brethren, this is how I'm handling prison. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen, amen. Another version said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Jesus in Matthew 6, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Don't worry. Stop worrying about things. Instead of worrying, pray. Amen. If we prayed half as much as we worried, there'd be revival. <laughs> Prayer is not mindless repetition or talking to yourself. It is coming before God with our needs and knowledge that his will for our lives is best. We seek him for his will to be done. We find out what God says for our situation and we get, begin to pray it down. Because God loves to answer your prayers. Amen. And what we're speaking about is the peace of God. Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, saith the Lord, to the wicked. But Paul says, if you and I will pray and not worry and not be anxious, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. This generation's answer, give you some medicine, turn you into a zombie. Yep. 
where you are just kind of numbed up. Philippians 4, 7, the Living Bible. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand, and I add it, and far more powerful and effective than any man-made drug or medication. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Amen. The message version. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Paul is writing this from a Roman prison. He says, I know what I'm talking about. I'm experiencing that right now. And listen, I want to share that with you because I know you're going through things. And if you'll do it, it works. I'm doing it right now, he said. Hallelujah. The peace of God and the God of peace. Here's a question. Is God worried about anything? Oh, Gabriel, what's going to happen next? I don't know what's going to happen next. Oh, what's he going to do? What's he going to do? <laughs> He said, I know the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. Yeah. Yes. Did you know that worry is a decision? When I got saved, I had a, a bit of an anger problem before I got saved. And very early in my salvation, God told me, anger is a choice. He made me angry. Hey, no, 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 you chose to be angry. He may have done something, you chose to be angry. God showed me, you know what, you can choose not to be. Amen. Come on, come on. Worry is a choice as well. Amen. Come on. I remember when I first got to Athens, I couldn't find work. First 18 months, I was out of work 10 months. It was, it was vexing. Mm. I mean, it vexed me. And I'm trying to work through it in my own heart and mind to this day. I don't know how we survive. But I remember, I finally said, you know what, I'm going to believe God. I'm not going to worry about it. And I, call, I was talking to a friend of mine back in Tucson. We had been in the army together and stuff. And I'm telling the situation, he goes, man, Gene, if I were you, I'd be worried. <laughs> I said, well, I'm not going to worry. You can worry for me. Come on. I made a decision. I'm not going to worry. When those, that anxiety and all that comes on me, I know I got a wife and three kids. When that, I said, no, I'm not going to worry. I'm going to trust God. Man, it man. was a decision. Man, man. Jesus said, do not be anxious or do not worry. So therefore, if we worry... We are disobeying what he said. How many know Jesus said don't steal? Man. So if you steal what? You've broken his commandment, you said. Jesus says don't lie. So if you lie, it's a sin. Yeah. Jesus said don't commit adultery. Why? It's a sin. Don't murder, it's a sin. He said don't be anxious. Oh, but Lord, I'm really concerned. Have you ever looked at worry as sin? Now, I'm not saying be oblivious to facts and reality. I'm saying sometimes you get so caught up being anxious and worry and all, that, you know what? It enters the realm of sin. And here's why Jesus tells us this. Because the cares of this world, if you allow them to continue, will choke off the word of God in your life. Amen. Isn't that what the Bible says? That the seed that fell you know, among thorns, that the, the, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke yeah. the word of God. Yeah. God does not want the word of God to be choked off in your life. He says, don't worry. Don't be anxious for anything, but by everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. I was talking about this with your pastor at lunch. He, he, he told me this thing. Will guard your hearts. It will be a military guard over your hearts. You listen, worry, anxious. You're not coming in here. Amen. 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 It'll guard your minds. So what do you worry about? What are you concerned about? <laughs> money? How many here have ever worried about money? Oh yeah. The lack thereof. How many here you've ever worried, man, I got too much money, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> if you have, come see yeah, me. I got yeah. a perfect plan. <laughs> We worry about relationships. Mm -hmm. 
We worry about health. Yeah. We worry about our children. We worry about our parents. Yep. We worry about our spouse. We worry about our nation. We worry about our politics. We worry about everything and anything. Some even worry that one day they won't have anything to worry about. <laughs> God says, don't worry, pray. Amen. When you find yourself, it's overwhelming, pray. Amen. Yes, amen. Rather than worry. Amen. amen. Jesus says, don't do it. Don't allow the word, the word of God to be choked off in your life. There's a real a tremendous scripture, all of them are tremendous, but Mark chapter 7. Verse 20 through 23, the Living Bible. Jesus said, it's the thought life that pollutes. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts of lust, theft, murder, adultery. Wanting what belongs to others, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, pride, and all other types of folly. All these vile things come from within. They are what pollute you and make you unfit for God. So Jesus is dealing with the thought life. It's the thought life. That's where things are happening. That's what really makes you unfit for God. And here Paul's solution, amen, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever thing, and he makes this list Think on those things. So he's given us a commandment about what to think about. Which tells me we can control our thoughts. Come on. He tells us don't be anxious. Don't worry. Pray. And then uh, uh, begin to think about these things. Reading a book and I'm actually doing a Sunday school on it. I'll switch on your brain by Carolyn Leaf. She writes these words. This means that if you are anxious or worried about something, the hypothalamus, it was one of your glands in your body, will respond by releasing more chemicals than it should. This in turn causes the pituitary gland to release too many chemicals, and the result is a neurochemical chaos inside your body. So instead of being focused in our thinking, we have chaotic and foggy thinking. The endocrine system secretes the hormones responsible for organizing the 50 plus trillion cells in our body to deal with focus and learning. But our thought life can change it all. Amen. You know what the great thing about salvation is? You can control your thoughts. Amen. Amen. Jesus purchased on the cross our free will back. He that sins is a servant of sin. Amen. But whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. And that we now have the ability to say, no, I'm not thinking about that. No, I'm going to think about this. No, devil, you're not running at my mind crazy anymore. I'm casting out these thoughts. I'm casting those. I'm not worrying about it. I'm going to pray about it. And I'm, uh, the peace of God is going to keep my mind and my heart. Amen. I get to choose what I think about. And I get to choose what I don't think about. I had a roommate in college when I got saved. His name's Eric Phillips. He's still saved. We had five of us living together. Uh, Forty years later, four of us are still saved. Amen. 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 And so I remember Eric came up back one day. He said, hey, Gene, I memorized a scripture. And he had, he had memorized Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in this life I now live by, by the faith of our Lord Jesus. And I was in awe, oh, wow. Whoa, Eric, that's incredible, man. You, whoa, how'd you do that? Dude, how'd you do that? I mean, I was in awe. Oh, I can actually remember a whole scripture. A little pea brain. 
And the first scripture I ever memorized was Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. And God spoke this to me. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then shall you make your way prosperous. Then shall you have good success. And I'm thinking, I'm, wow, I can actually do this. And God says, you know what? And, and I begin to meditate upon that scripture, and, and uh, it really does work. Amen. 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 And if you're going to exercise your God-given right and spiritual dominion and authority, one of the ways is you meditate upon the Word of God. One thing that really ticks me off, mm. and I can share that with Whoa. you, oh, yeah. <laughs> is everybody's idea of meditation. <laughs> <laughs> That's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Meditate. Meditate means think about something. Man, man. It's not get demon possessed through yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Study it out. I've studied it out. Mm. You know what I'm talking about. Mm. <laughs> it's uh, deciding I'm going to think about a certain thing, and you tell your mind what to do. I was talking to a brother right before, or right after church this morning, and I said, if I'm talking to you, and I go, I'm going like this. What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Dude, what's wrong? Oh, I can't control my arm. Oh, wow. You're going to go, dude, you're weird. Mm, too much. Isn't that what most people say? I Me. can't control my thoughts. Mm. Come on. Your thoughts are part of your body, your mind. Yeah. There it is. How come you can't control it? You've just never been taught how to do it. You can control your thoughts. You know, weightlifters, they have a thing called grip strength. Arnold Schwarzenegger said he could take 120 pounds and, you know, pinch grip, they call it. And I don't doubt it, the guy was built like a monster. But my thought is, how long can you hold a thought? How long can you hold a thought? The... The brain and the mind is an incredible, incredible creation of God. And God gives us the ability to focus, to concentrate, mm -hmm. to think, to meditate. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. Amen. Why? That you may observe to do according to all that is written therein, so that you can do it all. He says, then you'll have good success. Then you'll make your own way prosperous. Come on, come on. God says, if you'll do that. How was Jesus able to say, it is written? It is written. He was, he was, the word of God was in him. Yes, amen. And you can memorize, not to show off, you memorize so that when you're going about your daily chores and da daily activities and the enemy's arrow come, boom, you can put it out. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. At boot camp, we teach the kids how to memorize a scripture. And it, this is one of the most fun part of boot. When I have them all say it together and it's chaos, but they're, they're learning to concentrate and just put their focus right on that because that's real life. Yeah. You ever get a stupid song in your head? Come on. These stupid commercial songs? <laughs> or make you work somewhere where they're playing something you shouldn't be playing? Well, you know what? You can get a good song stuck in your head. Yes. Man, man. What I do personally, I've been doing this for years. When stupid thoughts come or old memories try to resurrect from the dead or they try to come out, you know what? I begin to quote scripture until that, sp that spell is broken. Yeah. I have a regular go-to scriptures, John chapter 1. You just begin to recite the whole chapter. That thing comes in as a dumb thought or maybe somebody said, and, and I'm battling. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was with God in the beginning. Uh, all things were made by Him, without Him was not anything made that was made, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Light shined in darkness, darkness comprehended not. The, I can go on for ten chapters. Mm. You can too. Mm -hmm. 
Because your brain is an incredible creation from God. Amen. You can do that. And the peace of God. You know that list that we read that Paul said, what sort of things are true, what sort of the only thing that fits all of that's the Bible? Yeah. Instantly thrown out is TV. Because oh, none of it's true. Come on, come on. <laughs> or righteous, or holy, or just, or lovely. That's right. Amen. Yeah, throw it out. But yet that's what consumes most people's minds. Entertainment, that doesn't fit in that list. Throw it out. But that's what people's minds are tormented by. Why not this book? Man. Uh, this book is incredible. It's incredible. It'll bring the peace that you're looking for. Are you with me? Amen. You know the eyes and the thoughts are connected. That's what Job said. Job 31.1. I've made a covenant with my eyes. Therefore, I will not think upon a maid. Because what you look at, you'll think about. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, as I said, that eliminates TV, movies, most news stations, and most of the internet. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, whatsoever things are for any virtue, any praise, think on these things. And the peace of God in your life is directly linked to your thought life. You can control your thoughts. Hallelujah. Verse 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So he talks about the peace of God. You think about certain things. He talks about the God of peace. You do certain things. So... The God of peace is directly linked to our obedience and discipleship. I want the peace of God, and I want the God of peace. I want them both with me all the time. Yeah. Not this part-time business. You ever seen that license plate? God is my co-pilot. You're a fool. <laughs> God needs to be your pilot. Because you don't know where you're going. He does. I want, I'll, okay, I'll be the co-pilot. God, you, you be the pilot because you know what you're doing. I'm just trying to stay along for the ride. Come on. I want to close with a thought. You know why God tells us not to worry? Because things can change like that. Think about this. Jesus says, don't be anxious. Why? Because it can choke off the word of God. I think there's a popular song in Texas, Wasted Days and Wasted Nights. How much time have we wasted worrying about things that never did happen? You ever hear a, a sound at night? <laughs> it's a cricket, dude. <laughs> it's, a cricket. it's not a 12 foot monster, okay? it's a cricket. He's rubbing his back legs together. <laughs> Amen. Your entire circumstance and situation can completely change in a moment of time. Hallelujah. We always imagine the worst, don't we? That's human nature. You ever get a, hey, pastor wants to talk to you. What do I do? <laughs> right? Isn't that what you think? When I was in school, the oh, principal wants to talk to you. Oh, man. What did I do? What did I do? Oh, man. you ever think that maybe you did something good? No, you didn't know me. <laughs> <laughs> but we seem to always focus on the worst. And a lot of times it never does happen. What about learning to imagine the best? Things can change, things can change for the better in a single moment of time. The Bible says the twinkling of an eye is that's the rapture is a twinkling of an eye. Moses at the burning bush, everything changed. Joseph being called by Pharaoh, everything changed. Lazarus in a moment of time, everything changed. The four leprous men uh, that were uh, at the city as it was being besieged, they were, they were eating dove's dung. And in one day, the entire economy completely changed for the good. Amen. Amen. 
How about the day of Pentecost? Everything changed for the entire world in one day. Hallelujah. The resurrection. In each one of these and many more, the entire set of circumstances huh, that could have been worried about were absolutely and completely changed for the good. And the Bible declares all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. And you know what? God meant that. That's why he said, listen, don't worry about things. I'm at work. I can turn things around. I'm working these things just just pray, don't worry, don't get anxious, don't become overly burdened. Pray, seek my face, I'll send the peace of God, and I, the God of peace, will be with you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus doesn't de deny the circumstances of life. He does say sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. But he does say don't be anxious about it. Pray. Hallelujah. Church, I believe we're entering into a time where God is going to accelerate his work on the earth, but it's going to be directly linked to our prayers. The enemy of our soul wants us to worry about this or worry about that. Or worry. No, no, I'm, made a decision. I'm not worrying, I'm praying. Yeah. I'm not worrying, I'm praying. I'm going to find out what God says about my situation, and I'm going to pray. Amen. I'm going to bring God's will from heaven down to earth, and that's what revival is. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Yes, good God. Praise. The world's stressed out. You read Romans chapter 1, you'll find out why. Romans chapter 1 is a direct uh, uh, description of the day and hour that we're in. Close of the story. There's an elderly mountain farmer had been involved in an accident between his mule-drawn wagon and a car driven by another man. Now the farmer was suing the driver, claiming personal injuries as a result of the accident. When the farmer was on the witness stand, the lawyer for the driver of the car said, Tell me, sir, isn't it true that right after the accident, you told the police officer you never felt better in your life? Well, the farmer began. That morning I got up. I hitched my mule to the wagon and put my hound dog in the seat beside me and I started on down the road. The lawyer interrupted, please, sir, just give me a simple yes or no to the question. At that point, the judge stepped in and directed the lawyer, hold your peace, let the farmer tell his story his way. Well, as I was saying, the farmer began, that morning I got up, I hitched my mule to my wagon, put my hound dog in the seat beside me. I started on down the road, and I just got over the rise of the road when this big old car came barreling around and smacked into the rear end of my car. My mule was knocked to one side of the road, my dog was knocked to the other, and I was pinned under the seat of my wagon. Directly a policeman come along, he seen my mule had its leg broke. So I seen the policeman, he pulled out his pistol and shot my mule in the head. Then I see him go over to my dog. He saw how my dog was hurt real bad, so he pulled out his pistol and shot him too. Then he came over to me and said, well, sir, how you feeling? <laughs> I seen that gun and I said, officer, I ain't never felt better in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's all how you look at it. Don't be anxious. Great, let's bow our heads together. Hallelujah.